night to study the Word of God another time, and tonight we're going to be coming from Luke, the 17th chapter, and the 11th to the 19th verse, but I want us to always remember that we've been in a series entitled Examining Ourselves. And the primary verse that we have been utilizing during this particular series, examining ourselves, has been 2 Corinthians 13 and 5, where the Word of God says, Test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test. So tonight we're going to be looking at Luke, the 17th chapter, the 11th to the 19th verse. But before we start to dig into to Luke, the 17th chapter, the 11th to the 19th verse, we'll open up in a word of prayer. Father God, we are grateful to be here tonight. Lord, you saw us over the highways and the byways to get to this place of worship tonight, and for that, we say thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you've been gracious and kind to us by saving us from our sins. You've been merciful to us, not giving us, Lord, what our sins truly deserve. And so tonight, Lord, we confess our sins before you. Because, Lord, we know that you know what our sins are. Yet we stand on the promise, Lord, that you will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, we pray tonight that as we study your our, study our word tonight, that you would open up the eyes of our hearts, that we may see you in your word, and that your word would be planted into our hearts, and that it may yield the fruit of obedience, yield the fruit of your spirit in all areas of our lives. Lord, we pray for our nation as always, and not only our nation, our nation's leaders, that you would turn the hearts of our nation's leaders to you, the hearts of this nation to you. Lord, I pray for those who are dealing with this pandemic, even during this Thanksgiving season, Pray for those, Lord, who are dealing with this pandemic in different parts of the world globally as well. And we pray for those, Lord, who are still dealing with the aftermath of the weather disturbances in various parts of our nation. We pray, Lord, for our first responders, our nurses, our doctors, police officers, firefighters, those who work in infrastructure, social workers, and, and the like who have to get out here on the front lines each and every day and serve humanity. We pray for every church that's opening your name today. We pray that you would strengthen us and increase our faith to trust you and not lean to our own understanding, but in all our ways acknowledge you because you promised in your word that you will direct our paths. You, Lord, have promised that you would never leave us nor forsake us. And so tonight, Lord, we just bless you now. And we give you all the glory that you so rightfully deserve. And it's in the matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ that we pray tonight. Amen. Amen. In Luke chapter 17, verses 11 to 19, this is what the Word of God says. It says, while he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. As he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. They raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said to them, Go and show yourselves to the priests. And as they were going, they were cleansed. 
Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks to him. And he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But the nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Stand up and go. Your faith has made Your faith has made you well. And so as we dig into this, the study tonight, the question that we're going to be asking ourselves that is going to enable us to examine ourselves is the question of, are you grateful? Are you grateful? And the reason why I ask that question is, tomorrow is Thanksgiving. And... Thanksgiving is one of those uh, many joys that we have the opportunity to partake in during this time of the year because it gives us an opportunity to celebrate this, ho this holiday with uh, not only just immediate family but even extended family that we have not seen in a long time or those whom we don't get a chance to see as often. Yet, in thinking about everything that is surrounding this particular Thanksgiving celebration, this celebration is going to be unlike celebrations that have occurred in the past. And the reason why this celebration is going to be unlike the celebrations that we have partook of in the past is because we are living with a disease that is under the umbrella that we call a pandemic and we call it coronavirus or for short I like to say CD19 and this disease is going to cause many families to change the way in which we celebrate Thanksgiving together. There are going to be some of us who are going to choose to socially distance ourselves. There are going to be some of us who, because they may have contacted coronavirus, who are going to quarantine themselves. There are some of us who are going to have small family gatherings with some of our immediate family that are in our household. There are going to be some of us who are going to use other means, other social media platforms that are going to help us maintain that connection with the family that we usually see on Thanksgiving. But because of the times, because of this disease, that is impacting not just our nation, impacting the world, we have to make some changes. And so just like we are dealing with a, a very deadly disease, when we come to the text that is before us tonight, we see some individuals who are identified as lepers. Text says uh, specifically in verse 12 as he entered a village, 10 leprous men stood at a distance and met him. They were practicing social distancing before we even began to coin the term social distancing to deal with this disease that we are facing during this Thanksgiving season. And to understand what it meant to have leprosy, 
we would have to go back to the Old Testament because the Old Testament gives us the backdrop and the background to how this particular disease was dealt with back then in order for us to understand what was going on in the text before us and even for us to receive application for what's happening today. And so specifically, what we need to first understand, but before I unpack what we need to understand, we'll go back to Leviticus chapter 13 and then put your finger in Leviticus chapter 13 and just hold it there. But understand, Leprosy was a very contagious disease. It was a very communicable disease, which meant that this disease could spread simply by the touch. And so people had to be extraordinarily careful when they encountered somebody who had leprosy. Hence, we see in the text in Luke, it says that they stood at a distance. But when we go to the Old Testament in Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 13, it gives us, we're not going to read all of Leviticus chapter 13, but actually to, to put it in context, if you wanted to read it in much deeper detail, Leviticus chapters 13 and 14 address this, this issue of leprosy. But specifically in Leviticus chapter 13 verses 1 to 3, it says that the Lord spoke to Moses and and Aaron saying, when a man has on the skin of his body a swelling or a scab or a bright spot and it becomes infection of leprosy on the skin of his body, then he shall be brought to Aaron, the priest, or to one of his sons, the priest. And the priest shall look at the mark on the skin of the body, and if the hair in the infection is turned white and the infection appears to be deeper than the skin of his body, it is an infection of leprosy. When the priest has looked at him, he shall pronounce him unclean. So this disease impacted individuals socially because they had to be sent away from their families. They had to be separated from their families to keep the disease itself from being contagious to those who were closest to them. But then if we keep reading and you come to Verse 45 of the same chapter. It says, As for the leper who has the infection, his clothes shall be torn. The hair of his head shall be uncovered. He shall cover his mustache and cry, Unclean! Unclean! He shall remain unclean all the days during which he has the infection. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. So you see there, the person with leprosy was socially isolated. We are living in a time today, beloved, even during a season of Thanksgiving where people among us are socially isolated because they have a contagious disease. And so, beloved, as we go back to Luke chapter 17, what we 
need to understand as we track our way back to Luke chapter 17 is it is important for us to understand what gratitude looks like. It's important to understand for us to know what gratitude looks like. And we have to make the distinction between surface levels of gratitude and actual saving gratitude. I mean, a person could have a surface level relationship with Jesus as we'll see in this text but not necessarily be saved. A surface level meaning they partake of the common graces by where God allows the sun to shine on the just as well as the unjust. And even those who are allowed to partake of the common grace of God, that does not necessarily mean that they have a saving relationship. It's one thing to be grateful for the sun rising this morning. It's another thing to be thankful for the S-O-N sun rising in our hearts as a basis of having a saving relationship with him. And so this, these verses before us tonight teach us that we can be grateful no matter what our circumstances are, we can be grateful. And if we are in isolation, we can be grateful. If we have the opportunity to gather with loved ones, we can be grateful. If we have to social distance ourselves and use other means of connecting with loved ones, beloved, we can still be grateful. And so, again, as we look at this text, I want us to see at least four movements in this text that I think we need to, to hide in our minds and in our hearts. And that is, one, the plea or the prayer for mercy. See, we need to be grateful for the mercy that God has given us. I mean, mercy is God not giving us what our sins truly deserve. So one of the first things that we see in this text before us tonight is a plea for mercy. Then after that, you'll see a provision of mercy. And then as we work our way through, you'll see praise for mercy. And then there is the picture which gives us a distinction between those who are in a surface relationship with Christ and they receive mercy common grace and those who are in a saving relationship. And so these verses below are actually more about our gratefulness for the mercy that God has given us throughout our lives. I mean, because none of us deserve to be living. Our sins deserve death. Yet God allows us to be here in order to still serve him and worship him and praise him. So let's get into this text though because the text, it says in verse 11, it says, while he was on the way to Jerusalem, he was passing between Samaria and Galilee. And understand, Samaria and Galilee are Gentile, heavily populated 
Gentile regions. And it says, as he entered a village, ten leprous men who stood at a distance met him. And verse 13, they raised their voices saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. They wanted Jesus to have compassion on them. Have mercy on us is what these men were pleading with Jesus. And the, 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 the master, the word that they use for master is, is, is a word that is used only, that is used, that is a favorite word of, of Luke when he writes. And so they went to Jesus, that they saw Jesus and they cried out to Jesus for mercy because they knew Jesus had the authority to be compassionate and grant them the mercy that they needed. And beloved, I want to encourage us that uh, when we find ourselves in unpleasant circumstances, in circumstances that cause us to have to be separated from those whom we love the most, whether it be due to this pandemic, whether it be due to some other health-related issue or something else that, that is not even related to disease. It's good for us to be able to cry out to God and ask God to have mercy upon us. And the reason why, you know, when it comes to our spiritual walk and our daily walk with the Lord, the reason why we need to ask the Lord to call out to us and have mercy upon us is because our sins separate us from God. Yet God has promised in his word in 1 John chapter 1 verses 9 and 10 that if we confess our sins, that is, if we say the same thing about our sins that God says about our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because the truth of the matter is, is uh, our sin can be leprous. Yes, our, our sin can be deadly. Our sin not only causes separation from God, but our sin can cause separation from others. And our sin can be communicable in the sense that our sin can have a ripple effect upon those who are closest to us. So there's nothing wrong with pleading to God to have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon me. So you see the plea, but verse 14 he says, when he saw them, he meaning Jesus, he said to them, go and show yourselves to the priest. Go and show yourselves to the priest. Coming back to Leviticus 13, where the word of God says, and somebody has something that looks like leprosy, they are to go to the priest. And what Jesus is communicating for us is, is that Jesus kept the law perfectly. Jesus obeyed the law. Go to the priest, he said. Go to the priest. Now, it's not as if the priests somehow were in Jesus' corner. No, they, they hated Jesus. The religious leaders wanted to kill Jesus. I mean, another backdrop to this is Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And these priests, they didn't like Jesus because Jesus bumped up against the system. 
So Jesus goes and says, go show yourself to the priest because when they saw the miracle that Jesus would be performing, they themselves would have to acknowledge that that came from God. Because miracles in the New Testament validated the messenger. Look, go with me to John. John John, the, the last chapter, 21. It says that in verse 25, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, which if they were written in detail, I suppose that even the world itself would not contain the books that would be written that would be written. Jesus did a lot of miracles but the purpose of the miracles was to validate that Jesus himself was God. Let's come back from John 21 and let's go to John 20 and verse 30 to 31 because it says here, therefore many other signs, miracles, Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So Jesus tells them to go and show themselves to the priest, coming back to Luke 17. And the text says that as they were going back to the priest, specifically, the text says, and as they were going, they were cleansed. As they were going, they were cleansed. This cleansed. They were they were healed. As they were going, they were healed. I mean, it shows you that that Jesus was the one who actually did. The healing. I mean, he didn't even have to really speak a word. He just said, tell, he just told them to go back to the priest and as they would go. Which means that Jesus was the one who, who healed them as they were going back to the priest as a means of obeying what the law said. So we see the provision of mercy. We saw the plea for mercy. We not only see the provision and the plea for mercy, but we begin to see the praise that comes about as a result of receiving mercy. Because when we look at verses 15 and 16, the word of God says, now one of them, one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at his feet, giving thanks, and he was a Samaritan. My God, he was a Samaritan. One of them, one of them when he saw that he had been healed. Now I'm sure the others were happy and were celebrating the fact that they had gotten healed. I mean, I'm sure like folk who are grateful for the sun and the rain, 
about him. Because it says when he saw that he had been healed, which meant that it had a physical impact upon his life. When, and it had a physical impact upon the other nine as well. But there was something distinctive about him because when he saw he had been healed, he turned back. He turned back to glorify God with a megaphone, <laughs> with a megaphone, with a loud voice. Can you imagine what you would be doing if you got healed of a disease that the doctor said there is no cure?
It's right there in the text. If you don't believe me, let's go to John. John chapter 4. John chapter 4, let's start at verse 9. These issues about ethnicity are in the scripture. John chapter 4, verse 9. I start at verse 7. It says, uh, there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. But watch what she says. Therefore, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink? Since I am a Samaritan woman. For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. acceptable for you to even be talking to me, let alone asking me for a drink because you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. I'm considered a half-breed by ethnicity and here you are a Jew asking me for something to drink. And so I want us to keep our, our thought here because uh, Jesus tells her, because he went through a whole list of issues with her. The, 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 the racial issue, the ethnicity issue was really, that was not the primary issue. The real issue was the fact that she, she was living a lifestyle of sin. And then she had a misunderstanding of the scripture as well. Because in John, in John chapter 4, verse 21, Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. But this leprous man was a Samaritan. Just like this woman of Samaria. Samaria. Yet, this man turns back, glorifies God with a loud voice, fell on his face at his feet, and gave thanks, and he was a Samaritan. Now the other nine were Jews. They went all back to the priests. Because here's the crux of the issue. They would have been able to go into the temple and worship. This Samaritan would not have been able to go inside the temple and worship. So he kind of had a double whammy. He had leprosy and he also had this ethnicity issue that excluded him from being included in the eyes of the Jewish people from the covenant community of God. And the sad thing about that is today, beloved, is we still do that mess. Yeah. That mess is still taking places, I don't even call them churches because they're not churches. If you're in a church, that excludes people on the basis of ethnicity. Get out that church. That's not even a church. That's a false church. And I'll tell the pastor to his face that you're preaching a false gospel and you're in a false church. You need to take the name of Jesus Christ off the face of that church because it's not a church. And that's whether it is black or white. Because Jesus came to break down the wall of partition. Go with me to Galatians. Mm -hmm. 
We get caught up on less than 1% of our genetic, genetic makeup. We know more about what it means to be of a certain ethnic group. We watch our ethnic group. We're more dedicated to our own per our own little ethnic group more so than we are dedicated to what the word of God says. But this is what the word of God says in Galatians chapter 3 verse 28 there is neither Jew nor Greek there is neither slave nor free there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants and heirs according to the promise. So this man was a Samaritan. He was a Samaritan, but he turn back to give God praise. Praise for his healing. I'm coming back to Luke chapter 17 and it says starting in verse 17 to 19 then Jesus answered and said were there not ten glands? He asked three rhetorical questions in this right here. He says, were there not ten glands? But nine, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except this boy? Accept this foreigner? I mean, this is a unique word right here in the in the in the Greek text. This is a this, this is a, a unique word. This foreigner, this Samaritan, somebody outside the covenant promises of God. Listen, this Samaritan couldn't receive mercy at the Jewish temple. But he can receive mercy from God. Hmm. Did you did you catch that? He can he couldn't receive mercy at the temple, the place which they believed God was present at. The priests were there, but yet the very God that they would try, that they would kill. He actually voluntarily laid down his life. He was the very God who healed this leprous man. Mm -hmm. And so he gives a picture about those who receive mercy and how we respond after we receive mercy. Do we respond with a grateful heart? Or do we respond in a way that treats Jesus like, yeah, thanks, Jesus, but you know, I got what I want, but I'm just gonna go on and I'm, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna keep it moving. I'm, do we respond ungratefully? Do we respond like ingrates? So, how do we respond to God's mercy? Because, again, what is distinctive about this Samaritan is what Jesus says in verse 19. He said to him, stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Stand up and go. Your faith has made you well. Now, I, I want us to 
understand. You can't see this just by plain reading of the text. You have to go behind the text. The, the whole idea has made you well. That, that word is not the word for healing. It's the word for salvation. What was distinctive about this Samaritan that, 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 that separated him from the service relationship of the other nine is this Samaritan had saving faith. This one out of the ten was saved by faith. The nine received God's common grace. Matthew 5, 45, he allows the sun to shine on the just as well as the unjust. They got what they wanted. They were back to their rituals. They were physically healed, but they were not spiritually healed. And so, we like the one who Returned out of saving faith can truly give God thanks first and foremost because he has saved us. He saved us out of his, his mercy and his grace. And no matter the situation no matter the challenge that we face in this Thanksgiving season, we need to remember, as Paul said to the Philippians or the church at Philippi, Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 to 7, I believe, and it says, uh, Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything, through prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Beloved, if we don't get anything out of this tonight, we need to understand that gratitude isn't just about words. I'm sure those nine, they had a lot of words. They had a lot of words for the priest. They had a lot of words probably for their, for their loved ones that, had, that they had been separated from. They had a lot of words, but but gratitude is more than just words. Gratitude expresses itself in the actions, in a transformed life. So when we have an attitude of gratitude, we can say what the psalmist says in Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord himself is God, and it is he who made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and bless his name for the Lord is good his mercy is everlasting his faithfulness is to all generations love is 
my prayer for everyone tonight that we have a blessed and safe, happy Thanksgiving and that we practice true gratitude because of the relationship that we have with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God bless you and may heaven smile upon you.